Bienvenidos a un programa especial de Aura Maker. Hoy nos hemos venido hasta el Fabla de León, al Bootcamp de Instructores de la Red Mundial de Fab Academy, para entrevistar a Neil Gersenfeld, que está por ahí atrás. Manos a la obra. Vamos ya con la entrevista. Thank you for your time and thank you for joining today, Laura Maker. I like to to talk about the three main main aspects of Fab Labs. It is the EDU aspect, the mm -hmm. org aspect, and the com aspect. And I was wondering, today we are at the bootcamp, instructor bootcamp. Could you introduce this for people that are not aware of what is this so, meeting? So in Domino's, I, I teach the how to make class at MIT. Then that led to Fab Labs the fab labs we needed to train people who came to them and so that led to doing the fab academy that was globally distributed uh, and in some ways i even say that the fab academy class is getting ahead of the mit class because th th there can be more focus on it in the labs so then there's a great group of instructors who teach the fab academy um, and it's not just knowledge from me out it the knowledge comes from everybody in the network um, synthesized and each year before we run it we get together to refresh it to update the content and so this week we're working on things like the impact of ai on design and new kinds of fabrication tools and new programming workflows and new ways to make machines and so we're curating all of the content for the fab academy i did hear the, the fab academy 10 years ago in leon in the in the old lab and I was wondering how the, the whole syllabus has changed over the last year, because, for example, in our first year, we were with Fab ISP creating our own board. And I know there have been some discussion to introduce other other boards, other open source uh, mm -hmm. elements on that. Could you? Oh, I'd say every year, maybe a th even a third of the class changes. So s since you did it, um, the processors are much more powerful. You can use much higher level language. Uh, is one kind of change. Uh, the design tools are more powerful and um, increasingly there's a very interesting complex relationship between large language models and AI systems and the design workflows. Um, we've introduced a number of new kinds of fabrication processes and I'd say for me the most uh, important change is the, the growing importance of the machine building component. And so you come here not to learn to use the lab, but you come here to learn to make the lab. That's part of the idea of the FAB 2.0. Yep. And I, I would like to go back to designing reality because we did a whole review of the whole book in the, okay. in the channel uh, oh, a few years ago. Um, uh, I'm, um, one of the things that when pandemic stuck and there were a ton of fab labs contributing mm -hmm. and a ton of places around the world, but one of the things I also realized was that the manufacturing capacity was totally distributed mm -hmm. because in a way, I was wondering in, in some way the last law on the growth mm -hmm. of fab lab network. And I was feeling that there were a lot of other places that maybe not, were not fab labs, maybe there were personal places that mm -hmm. had already capabilities. So uh, after these five, 10 years of the growth of the fab lab network, how do you feel in terms of the, the growth ahead? And maybe it's, it's everything is growing as expected or is it growing in different? Well, the growth is, is going to change. From one to a thousand labs, we would count the labs and you knew what a fab lab was. <laughs> um, that's going to go away. As we go from a thousand to a million, okay. um, we're not going to count. It's no longer really important to count individual labs. They'll just, you know, the capabilities will be everywhere. Um, it'll be much more widely distributed. And so um, for the growth, I see a couple aspects. One is the underlying research. So right now with the Fab 2.0, we're doing a lot of work on deploying the machine building. And then um, upstream from that, back in the lab, there's a lot of work on sustainable reuse of materials and creating more advanced capabilities you can do in the field. Like you can, today you can use a microcontroller, but you can't make a microcontroller, creating the future technology roadmap. But analogous to the internet, the real legacy of this Fab Lab movement is gonna be the programs and organizations. So things like the Fab Academy for classes, and it, it spawned many other classes now. Um, 
and the Fab City initiative of cities being able to produce what they consume and things like legislation, for example, in the US for universal access to digital fabrication. Well, the real legacy are the programs growing out of the network. One of the programs that was started a few years ago by uh, Bart Baker was this kind of the idea of the mini Fab Lab to mm -hmm. make it more accessible, more affordable also to, to grow. And I know that the prices of most of the machines have gone down over the years. I, I don't know if you are tracking actively what is... So we're tracking that very actively. So, um, I mean, just here at the boot camp, we're, we're setting up one of my favorite current machines, which is the um, Lunyi little, inexpensive, but um, you know, substantial milling machine. Uh, we've been doing a project. W um, for the last few years, SolidWorks has funded deploying Fab Labs in places, unusual places that need it. So things like um, Bhutan and um, uh, Rwanda and the southernmost city on Earth. And this year, what we've been doing with that SolidWorks collaboration is a project called Fab in a Box, which is to develop a low-cost Fab Lab aimed at things like educational applications. And very early, we split that into two tracks that we've called cots and knots. Cots is commercial off the shelf. And in that, we're benchmarking all of the faster, better, cheaper commercial machines. And so uh, low cost 3D printers and milling machines and laser cutters. And not all, many of them are coming from our friends in Shenzhen and the Chinese okay. ecosystem who are really doing a great job of making faster, better, cheaper machines. And then uh, next door to that, we're working on machines um, with open designs you can make in the lab. And the open designs of the machines aren't going to beat the commercial COTS machines for price or performance, because they're really well optimized. Um, but what they do is the skills are local, um, the supply chain is local, and you can com customize them for local needs. And so there's an interesting competition we're doing with ourselves between the cots and the knots. Um, and I like these cots machines, but the knots have many benefits beyond just the price of the machine. I'm thinking this is quite of the same thing happening with large language models right now, with the benchmarking of the open versus the yep. closed one. And thinking about AI and the and the and the future, I was reading uh, when things start to talk <laughs> that I just realized it's almost 25 years old. And one of the many ideas is make the technology and the machines being able to talk like in a completely different way, and maybe with all these new chat interfaces, conversational interfaces, how do you think this is, has changed well, landscape in so, the last... <laughs> so yeah, many of these revolutions uh, on the upside seem like it's going to change everything. Um, and on the downside, they succeed kind of by irrelevance. They sort of disappear. So like, you know, in, in, in my pocket is this object like most people today, you know, this has the power of a supercomputer. Uh, it has global connectivity. Um, I can already talk to it and it answers and gives me uh, interesting questions. It contains just about all of my knowledge. All of those things just a few years ago were world changing. Now it's, we've adopted it, we've taken it for granted and it's part of how we live. And so, you know, the, there's a lot of attention now to AI as a discontinuous thing, but this is the fifth AI revolution I've lived through. <laughs> and it'll change some things, some won't change, and it'll get adopted in how we live. Um, I, I, I think both the, the discussion of the threats and the world-changing impact, bo both of the extremes of that overshoot, I think, a, a, a reality. I do believe in history, and over and over, technologies we're going to break everything, and you know, um, on the downside, some things change, um, and life goes on. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think uh, one of the, these ideas is technology going invisible behind. And I was wondering how this is uh, starting to merge with digital fabrication tools in terms of uh, creating new designs, uh, making things simpler, even to interact with. Yeah. So 
uh, it's really important to view the synthesis of digital communication, computation, and fabrication. And so you know, the research back in my lab is to really make that literal, that <clears throat> I have a new project aiming to essentially create life and non-living material by coding the construction of self-reproducing systems. And so you know, ultimately it's going to happen <laughs> At, at, at this fundamental molecular level. And so fab, fab zero was you had to go to a place like MIT. Fab one is you come to a fab lab like this. Fab two is you use the lab to make the lab, and that's progressing quickly. Uh, when, when we started, people didn't really believe in the fab two stage. Um, fab three is instead of printing and cutting, you assemble and disassemble. And that's the kind of work in the lab. And fab four is you lose the distinction between the machines and the materials with self-reproducing systems. And both of those sound fictional, but that's the kind of work we're doing hard in the lab to make this connection deeper and deeper. Yeah, the, the main challenge where we were reviewing the, with the, the different states in designing reality, what you were mm -hmm. like explaining the fact, mo most people were like concerned about energy and consumption and computational expenditure with, mm -hmm. but I assume part of that it's embedded into small materials so, themselves. Yeah, so the number of parts to that, the for um, in the near term, we've been doing a lot of work on life cycle sustainable materials and collaborating with groups like uh, the Materiome Project and uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the U.S. Uh, on displacing um, uh, feedstocks for fab labs with completely renewable sources just in the short term. But um, further out, you know, biology doesn't have trash. Biology reuses all of the parts. And so in this transition to assemblers, there's no waste. You, you assemble, you disassemble, and reassemble. And so th th that's this much, you know, trash itself is an analog concept. Um, when you have information in the materials, you can disassemble and uh, reassemble. Um, energy, let's see, the worries about energy in the computation. Um, so one of the furthest out projects in my lab is working on uh, superconducting electronics that runs at zectojoules. So the prefixes are milli, micro, nano, pico, femto, addo, zepto. So uh, 10 to the minus 15 joules. And that's near... Um, uh, KT, the fundamental unit of thermal energy. And so in the lab, we're working on computation that runs at fundamental physical limits. And again, that's research that's further out, but it promises orders of magnitude reduction in uh, computation power consumption. And last question, uh, going back to books, I was reviewing Singularities Near, where th mm -hmm. and I saw that you were one of the reviewers of the of the book in terms of the digital fabrication aspect, and I stumbled with a new version that is coming next year, that is Singularities Near. Right. How near we are to this? <laughs> so that's a great question. Uh, Ray Kurzweil is a friend, and... I, I have a complex relationship with him. Uh, many of the people who follow him don't do their homework. They be, it's like a religion, the okay. singularity. Ray is much more careful. Ray does his homework. Um, he makes projections, many of which I sort of viscerally find annoying, but he does his homework. And then he points out how many of the things I work on just fit on his projections. So from his perspective, I'm, I'm just executing his roadmap. Okay. And, um, you know, where his projections lead are go beyond what I'm comfortable projecting, but the data is solid. So... At the heart, what it really comes down to is a sigmoid is a curve like that, an exponential is a curve like that. In the beginning, a sigmoid and an exponential look the same, but the sigmoid rolls off. The only way to stay as an exponential is you have to keep stacking up the sigmoids. Okay. <laughs> and so the question really comes down to, are we on a sigmoid or are we on an exponential? And um, I don't think there's enough time to tell the difference. 
enough data to tell the difference, time will tell. But Ray is, in the end, had a pretty good track record for his projections. And, and you are seeing like everyday projects on your lab that are mostly consolidating ideas or yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's a good, interesting point. So thank you for your time. Enjoy okay. your time at Leon good. and Spain and General. I, I, I appreciated the conversation. Your questions were good. Thank you. <laughs>